Assalamu alaikum, my dear brothers and sisters, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you to our fourth session on the tafsir of Surah Fatir, the 35th chapter of the Holy Quran. In our last session, we left off at verse number five, and uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses humankind, saying, Ya ayyuhan nas, inna wa'adallahi haq, that the promise of God is true, that there is a life after death, that your existence does not end with death. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala issues a warning. He warns us about two dangers that we face. And those two dangers are فَلَا تَغُرَّنَّكُمُ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا Do not be, be deceived by dunya because dunya is temporary. It will never fulfill you. So there are two Ds that Allah warns us about. The dunya فَلَا تَغُرَّنَّكُمُ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا Don't be deceived by dunya and don't be deceived by the devil. وَلَا يَغُرَّنَّكُمْ بِاللَّهِ الْغَرُورِ so Allah warns us about these two, the dunya, which is an external attraction, and then the devil, where you have this, these internal satanic insinuations, these internal whispers. And this brings us to verse number six, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then specifically speaks about the danger of shaitan. The danger that Iblis poses uh, to human beings. Allah says, Inna shaytan lakum aduum fatahiduhu adua. Indeed, Satan is an enemy to you. That there is a being, there is this creature who has a great deal of hostility towards you. He is an enemy to you. Fatahiduhu adua. So take him as an enemy. Take this seriously. He only invites his party, his followers, to be among the companions of the blaze. Now, now the word shaitan is a description. It's a title that's given to this creature. And shaitan comes from the word shapana, right? And it literally means distant or to be distant or to be astray. And therefore you find that shaitan is a description that can be even given to human beings. The Quran mentions, mentions shayatinul insi wal jinn, the, sa the satans among people and among jinn. So this description of shaitan is a general description and it applies and it refers to any being that possesses free will that has distanced themselves from the mercy of God. So this is why it, it, it takes on a theological connotation and it, it refers to a creature that is that has withdrawn itself from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's grace and his guidance and his mercy. So shaitan, shaitan is a title, is a description, is an adjective that can be given to human beings and jinn. Now, Iblis is a proper name. Okay, so Iblis is the actual name of this creature who became notorious for his uh, rebelliousness against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, interestingly, the, the the name Iblis, the word Iblis comes from the word Balasa, which means he despaired. So even, even the name seems to foreshadow his, uh, his fall uh, from grace. And his enmity, you know, the Quran mentions that Allah says that he is an enemy to you. Now, this enmity this hostility towards human beings. And of course, this is these are certain truths, certain realities that we can only know through revelation. 
You know, there's no way of, of gathering this type of information just through observation. You know, this is knowledge that we, that we draw from revelation. Now, his enmity towards insan, towards human beings, goes back to the, the creation of Adam, alayhi salam. And specifically, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala announced, you know, this, this hatred started to fester within him, when Allah azza wa jal announces, you know, inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa, that I'm going to appoint a vicegerent on earth. And this was before Allah blew the ruh into Adam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had revealed to his angels and to his cre creation that there will be a test and one of you will fail this divine test. Now, interestingly, the riwayat, the ahadith mentioned that the malaika were apprehensive. They were worried. They were concerned. Each angel questioned themselves. They, they thought that maybe they were the ones who might falter. The narrations mentioned that the only one who was not concerned, who was confident in himself, was Iblis. In fact, Iblis would even tell the angels that, you know, don't worry, I, I will make dua for you. I'll, I'll pray that you don't, that you don't fail this, uh, this, uh, this trial. And then he is ultimately the one who, uh, who falls from grace. Now, the, the animosity that Iblis has towards Adam and towards human beings in general goes back to this famous incident that is mentioned approximately seven times in the Quran. For example, in Surah Al-A'raf, verses 11 and 12, Allah says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَاكُمْ ثُمَّ صَوَّرْنَاكُمْ That we have certainly created you, O mankind, and we've given you form. صورناكم, we shaped you. ثُمَّ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ تُسْجُدُوا لِآدَمْ Then we said to the angels, prostrate to Adam, فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا إِبْلِيسِ لَمْ يَكُمْ مِنَ السَّاجِدِينَ So they prostrated except for Iblis. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks Iblis, قَالَ مَا مَنَعَكَ أَلَّا تَسْجُدَ إِذْ أَمَرْتُكَ what prevented you from prostrating when I commanded you? What does Iblis say? I am better than him. Because you created me from fire and you created him from clay. There are some narrations in Al-Kafi that mention why Iblis believed that fire was better than clay. And this is a very lengthy discussion, but in a nutshell, it seems that the rank of creatures, the hierarchy of creation is related to nur, is related to light. And the more nur that a creature possesses, the higher, the higher they are on this, in this hierarchy. Now, Iblis thought that fire is better than clay because there is more nur in fire, and this goes back to the the theory of the famous Persian philosopher as Sahurwardi, you know, Hikmatul uh, Ishraq, the Illuminist tradition, where he theorizes that that your position in creation is related to the light within your uh, your being. So, in any case, Iblis believed that fire was better than clay because there is no there is more light in fire than in clay, but what he failed to realize is that this is only the vahiri dimension of man. That, that you're judging insan based on his physical reality. But the soul has a great potential for, for light. Now, so in any case, Iblis refuses. And he begins to, to bargain with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here I'm just trying to kind of give you a sense of where this animosity comes from, why Iblis is such a great danger to the human being and to the human race. So Iblis, after disobeying and refusing to prostrate, he, he begins to bargain with Allah. And he says, and, and this is cited 
This is not mentioned in the Quran, but rather it's mentioned in traditions. He says, by your glory, if you excuse me from prostrating before Adam, I shall worship you with devotion unmatched by any of your creatures. So in essence, he says, Allah, excuse me of a sajda towards Adam, and I will worship you in a way that no creature has ever worshipped you. You know, it goes back to this idea that we want, we, we want to worship Allah the way we want to worship Him. Right? And some of us, we've adopted this kind of satanic mentality where in essence we're worshipping ourselves. We want to dictate to Allah how we should worship Him, how we should obey Him. So Allah, so God replies, Allah replied flatly, I have no need for your worship. I wish but to be worshipped as I want, not as you want. He refuses, stubbornly refuses. Allah banishes him and he becomes mal'oon, he becomes accursed and he becomes an outcast. He's removed from the higher assembly that he used to, uh, that he had access to. So Iblis, again, Iblis knows who he's dealing with. He appeals to Allah's rahmah. So you see, even Iblis knows that Allah is generous. He knows that Allah is just. So Iblis objected. When Allah banished him, he says, My Lord, how is this possible when you are just? So even when Iblis angers Allah, Iblis knows that Allah is just even when he is angry. He says, is the reward for all my deeds nothing? That all of these years, these hundreds or thousands of years, hundreds or thousands of years that I've worshipped you, it means nothing? I'm not compensated for it? So Iblis knew very well that he had, he had transgressed. But what, what was he doing now? According to these narrations, he begins to appeal to Allah's mercy and his generosity and his justice. You know, as the Quran says, Hal jaza'ul ihsan illa al -ihsan. When you do good, you will receive good. Now, <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he grants him certain requests. And I'll get to that in a little bit. So Iblis begins to make certain demands. But look at the arrogance of Iblis. So, uh, so one aspect of his statement here is of arrogance. That not only has he, he disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he's trying to create a mutiny. That he wants, to, he wants to misguide other people. He wants to turn others away from Allah. Now, can you imagine how evil this is? It's one thing if, if you want to distance yourself away from God. But why do you want to deprive others of Allah's rahmah? So he says, So after he's banished, By your might, by your izzah, by your might, I, were, I will surely mislead them all. So not just Adam. So at least doesn't say, I will mislead Adam and his progeny. So he has even a vendetta not just against Adam and Hawa, but against the descendants of Adam. But then he realizes that he made a very bold uh, claim, a bold promise, and he, he, he retracts a bit. <inaudible> Except among them, meaning among the uh, human beings, among the progeny of Adam, Except among them, your chosen servants. Now, this shows you that Iblis السلام, recognizes the infallibility of some human beings. So, the issue of Isma, the infallibility of prophets or imams, the infallibility of certain people, is a discussion that goes back to the beginning of creation. I will cause them. To all go astray, except your chosen servants. Now question here. If Adam is the only human being, how does Iblis know that there will be 
people in his progeny who, who will be mukhlasin. You know, and this shows us that malaika, that even Iblis knew that there will be in the future special servants of God who cannot be misled. And this is why, for example, when we read in Hadith Al-Kisa, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I have, you know, ma khalaqtu sama'an mabniya wa la ardan madhiya, that Allah speaks about this idea that he created the heavens and the earth out of love for the Ahlul Bayt. So this shows us that the prophets and the Ahlul Bayt, they were known even before their physical creation. So Iblis says, I cannot mislead them, but I will put forth great effort to misguide the rest of them. So Iblis makes certain demands. So after he's banished, he asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to compensate him for his worship, for his good deeds. So he begins to make certain requests. He makes some demands. And some of these are mentioned in the Quran and some of them are mentioned in the hadith uh, sources. Number one, he asks for respite. He asks for time. You know, usually when you commit a crime, you're punished. You're punished for it. You know, if someone commits murder, God forbid, they're not going to just let him. He's, he's sentenced and he's jailed. Here, Iblis asks for time. Let me be free for some time. Give me respite till the day they are raised up. Allah grants him time. But not until the day of judgment, until the promised day. Some say that this will happen during the uh, the Zuhur of the 12th Imam. In any case, Allah gives him time that you're not going to be punished now. I'll give you some uh, respite. Allah grants him this. Allah says, surely you are of the respited ones. So he's, he's given this, uh, this request. The second demand is alluded to in this verse from Surah Hajj. He want, Iblis wanted to have power over Adam's progeny. He wanted to be able to, to pull them towards Batil, to misguide them, to have a type of power and influence over them. Allah says, indeed, my servants, no authority will you have over them except those who follow you of the deviators. So this request that he makes is partially granted. I will allow you to have influence over those who follow you, but those who are my servants, I grant them protection from you. The third demand that he makes, and this is, This is mentioned in a hadith and it's also alluded to in the Quran. He asks Allah, let me move freely among them as blood flows through their veins. He asks to get very close to us. He says, for example, in Surat Al-A'raf, ثُمَّ لَآتِيَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ وَعَنْ أَيْمَانِهِمْ Iblis says, then I will come to them from before them, from in front of them, and from behind them, and on their right and on their left, meaning that I will swarm them. I will be very close to them. And some ahadith mention that in the shaytan layajri min ibn Adam majra dami min al uruq that the hadith says that Iblis flows through us in the same way that blood flows through our veins. So he asked to be close to us. So he, he has the ability to get close to us, especially if we are in a state of ghafla. So this physical proximity to us, he's, he's been granted this. 
and this is why as a as a side note one of the recommended acts especially you know if someone is planning on having a child if a husband and a wife wish to conceive it's recommended to be in a state of wudu and it's also recommended to to do the tasmiya to say bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim to mention allah because if that doesn't happen shaitan is present during the conception of the child so we have to try to apply some of these mustahabbat because he he has the ability to get close if we're not uh, if we're not vigilant and when it comes to these very delicate moments we don't want shaitan to be a participant in the conception of our children and this is mentioned in the riwayat washarikum fil amwali wal awlad you know that he speaks about being a partner with them in their wealth and in their children and some scholars say this refers to uh, him being there during uh, conception if someone is not in a state of uh, of dhikr if they don't mention allah number 4 the fourth demand that iblis makes the fourth request that he makes is for every one of them meaning for every human being that is born let two be born to me la yul and the this is the the, the narrations mention that he says la yuladu lahu walad illa wulida laka waladan so allah grants him this he says for every human being that is born two from your progeny are born so he asks he's essentially asking allah to grant him a lot of foot soldiers. So he believes, he sees Adam, he says, okay, he's going to multiply and procreate. I'm going to be outnumbered. So how am, I going to, how am I going to misguide him if I'm only one? So Allah gives him the ability to, to procreate. And it seems that he, how he procreates, we can leave this for another time. I'd, I would have to check the narrations, but it seems that that he's able to kind of regenerate. Although uh, jinn do engage in uh, in copulation, you know that's why when Allah speaks about the hur al He says uh, tams, uh, that they have not been touched by jinn or human beings, which is a reference that they are capable of sexual uh, activity. Number five: Let me see them, but let them not see me. This is a request that Iblis makes. And this is also mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Al-Araf. In Surah Al-Araf, there are many, there's a lot of detail about the story of Adam and Iblis. It says, إِنَّهُ يَرَاكُمْ Iblis sees you. It's not that he knows about you, he, he can see you. إِنَّهُ يَرَاكُمْ هُوَ وَقَبِيلُهُ And he sees you. He and his tribe, he has a tribe, he has a, a network of supporters. Shaitan is very organized. Indeed, he sees you, he and his tribe, from where you do not see them. So just because you can't see him, it doesn't mean that they, they don't have eyes on you. They're able to see you. Not only Iblis, but also his tribe, his Ashira, his relatives, his family members, his supporters. Number six, let me manifest myself before them in any form I wish. So Iblis, of course, being a jinn and having a subtle body that is not seen, it's not visible to the human eye, but he asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to mutate and take on any form that he wishes. So Allah grants this, but with certain restrictions so allah says you shall not manifest yourself in the form of my prophets so iblis cannot take the form of a prophet because this could cause you know mass deviation he cannot take the form of the awsiya of prophets or the righteous believers he cannot take the form of a mu'min but you will be able to manifest yourself in any form you wish in the form of an animal in the form of a human being who's not mu'min it's possible Number seven. So is it possible, according to this narration, that maybe you've seen Iblis in the human form? It's possible. Of course, you might not be able to verify this, but 
The only form that he is not able to assume are the forms of Anbiya, Awsiya, and Mu'mineen. Number seven, Iblis appeals to God's generosity and simply asks for more. He says, oh Allah, give me more, give me more. So Allah says, I will make a place for you and your progeny in their hearts so that you can whisper to humankind. So he asked for proximity to man, but Allah says, I'll, make, I'll give you even more access to them. I will allow you to whisper into their hearts. Now, of course, Adam السلام, when Allah says prostrate to Adam, it means Adam is conscious. And this exchange between Allah and Iblis was heard by Adam. So as Adam السلام, witnessed this exchange between his creator and his newfound enemy, he felt despondent. Now you can only imagine when, when Adam السلام, hears all of the advantages that are given to Iblis, he must have felt overwhelmed, overpowered. So Adam asks Allah, why he had granted Iblis so many of his requests. So Allah says to him, because of an act that I feel obliged to reward. What did Iblis do that you, you're compensating him in dunya so generously? Allah, and this is mentioned in riwayat, in a hadith. Allah says he prayed a single prayer that lasted 4,000 years. Jinn seem to have amazing abilities and capacities you know you and i we think we develop ujb and uh sal we, we you know we think that we're godly and spiritual because we pray salatul layl for a few days at least one prayer lasted for 4000 years imagine at least his outward devotion was something that was impressive so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Adam says to Allah, you have given Satan all these advantages over me and my children. What advantages are you going to give to me so I can counter the influence of Iblis? What does Allah say? He says, Allah says to, Iblis, to Adam, for you and your progeny, I have ordained that each sin shall be punished in kind. You commit a sin, you, you get punished, one punishment for that sin. While each good deed shall be rewarded tenfold. So Allah doesn't you know, amplify the, the punishment. He, the, the punishment is commensurate with the crime. But when you do good, the reward is not commensurate with the, the good deed. Allah multiplies it tenfold at least. So whenever you do good, I multiply it by ten. If you do evil, you're compensated for that evil, for its kind. Adam alayhi salam says, Ilahi zidni, Ya Rab zidni, give me more. Allah says, for every child born to you, I will assign two angels to guard him against sin. These are other than the angels that record. These are not kiram and katibin. So yes, they might, Iblis might outnumber you, but for every human being, there are two jinn that, that whisper good to him. And this could be, you know, the reason why we have this propensity towards good, you know, because they are these, angelic whispers you know these pure thoughts that come to us it could be that it, it comes from these uh these angels they they you know they motivate us to do good we get you know sometimes this 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 positive energy to do good it could be from these malaika allah says so la yuladu laka waladun illa ja'alta ma'ahu malakain yahfadani I will assign two angels to guard him against sin. Adam asks for more. Lord, please give us more. Allah then says, قَالْ أَتَّوْبَةُ مَعْرُوضَةٌ فِي الْجَسَدْ مَا دَامَ فِيهَا الْرُوحِ Allah says, the gates of repentance shall remain open 
open to you until your soul passes your throat at the time of death. So even if you've committed so many sins and you're on your deathbed, the gate of Tawbah is open until the, the soul reaches the throat. So you always have the opportunity to turn back to me, to seek my pardon, to, to start a new page with me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Arham al-Rahimin. He's al-Ghafoor. He's the oft forgiving. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so Adam says, Oh Allah, give, give, give us more. Then Allah says, ubali. I shall absolve you of your sins without consideration for exacting justice. You know, Allah doesn't only forgive us for the sins that, that we ask him to forgive us for. Allah, on the day of judgment, he'll pardon us for many sins that we haven't even asked him to forgive us for. So Allah says, I will pardon, I will be very merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to nitpick. He's going to be so generous and so forgiving and kind on that day. And then the narration says that Adam says that will suffice us. Now, <clears throat> at the end of verse number six, Allah says, Inna yad'u hizbahu. Iblis only, he only invites his party, his his. Now, last year, if anyone wants more information about Shaytan's recruitment process, I gave a lecture on this in Toronto uh, last year. So if you want to go online and listen to a detailed discussion on how Shaytan recruits the human being, you know, how does he go from whispering into their souls, into their hearts, to recruiting them and having them become members of his party and, you know, activists within his party. You can listen to that lecture. Just type in my name and uh, Satan's recruitment process. You can find a lengthy discussion on that. But for our purposes here, so Allah says, don't, you know, in the shaytan alakum adu fattakhiduhu aduwa. Satan is an enemy, so take him as an enemy. Unfortunately, some people... They don't consider him an enemy. Not only are they not neutral, you know, it, it would be problematic if you just thought that, that you're neutral, that you're indifferent to him. Some people are, take it even further. Not only are they indifferent, are they not indifferent, they consider him a friend. They enlist themselves in his group, in his party. He only invites his party. Again, shaitan only has the ability to invite. He doesn't have the ability to seize control over someone's soul. We don't believe that shaitan can possess someone's soul. He invites you. And then if you succumb to his pressures, then you can relinquish control to him. As Imam Hussein Hussain says about those who came and fight him, is shaitan. Shaitan Controlled their hearts because they they surrendered control to him. <inaudible> he invites his party to be among the companions of the blaze. Now, of course, Shaitan doesn't tell them that. By the way, I'm taking you to Jahannam. No, we we obviously know that we know that he beautifies sin. He makes it attractive in their eyes. He he. He adds glitter and glamour to, to acts of sin to attract us. And on the day of judgment, now again, when you're when you're when you enlist yourself in his party, when you become a follower of Shaytan and you make him your leader, he is not the type of leader that cares about his followers. He will betray you. You know, this is not a group where the members of this group are loyal to one another. And this is why we see that on the day of judgment, people will look to him, that he's their leader. Now, what does he do to those who followed him? Does, is Iblis loyal? He's not loyal. Allah in Surah Ibrahim, Surah uh, 14, Ayah 22, وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرِ and Satan will say, when the matter has been concluded, this is on the day of judgment, after people have been sent to paradise, or after the people have 
after people's destinies has been determined by Allah, he'll, he'll stand up and he'll give a speech. And Allah has mentioned this. This is something that will happen on that day. Allah gives, he, he gives us the news of this. What does he say? When, when everything is all said and done and the people of paradise are directed to Jannah and the people of Jahannam are cast into the fire, he stands up and he says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَعَدَكُمْ وَعَدَ الْحَقِّ Indeed, God has promised you the promise of truth. Allah doesn't break His promises. وَوَعَدْتُكُمْ And I also promised you. Can you imagine this day? I mean, what, what a scene. What a sight. وَوَعَدْتُكُمْ فَأَخْلَفْتُكُمْ And I also promised you, but I betrayed you. Imagine the hearts of these people sink when they hear this. وَمَا كَانَ لِي عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانٍ إِلَّا أَنْ دَعَوْتُكُمْ فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْ لِي People on the Day of Judgment, this is mentioned in other verses in the Qur'an, people will blame each other. You know, sometimes people who, who, whose hearts are so polluted, where lying has, been, has become a part of their nature, some of them will try to lie to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment. They will not take responsibility. They will act like they're victims. They will point the finger at others. They'll point the finger at the finger of blame at Shaytan. Shaytan will say, listen, I had no authority over you except that I invited you. Don't blame me. I invited you and you responded. Don't blame me. Blame yourself for accepting my invitation. فَلَا تَلُومُونِي Iblis says, don't blame me. This is not the day to blame others. فَلَا تَلُومُونِي وَلُومُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ So do not blame me, but blame yourselves. مَا أَنَا بِمُصْرِخِكُمْ وَمَا أَنْتُمْ بِمُصْرِخِي He says, I cannot be called to your aid, nor can you be called to my aid. I can't help you today, and you cannot help me. You're on your own. You're on your own. Now contrast this with mu'mineen, where they do shafa'a for each other, where they care about each other, where they intercede with Allah on each other's behalf. It's a completely different group, different souls. The natures of these souls, these are selfish souls. Inni kafartu bima ashraktumuni min qabl. He, shaitan even renounces them. Indeed, I... Deny your association association of me with God before. But I, I, I denounce you. I disassociate myself from you. Indeed, for the wrongdoers is a painful punishment. In the valimin, alahum adabun alim. Shaitan admits that I'm valim, you're valim. That's it. This is our, this is the consequence of turning away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Verse number seven. Alladina kafaru lahum adabun shadid. Walladina amen wa amilu salihat lahum maghfiratu wa ajrun kabir. Those who reject, so those who follow shaitan, those who follow, those who reject will have a severe punishment. And those who believe and do righteous deeds will have forgiveness and great reward. In some translations, they write those who disbelieve. But this is not, I don't believe that this is an accurate translation. Because there may be someone who don't believe, they don't believe in, in Islam, they don't believe in, in God and the, and the prophets, because they, the truth has not reached them. So they're disbelievers, but are they are they deserving of punishment? Many of them are mustab'afin. They're just victims of their circumstances. They were they missed out on the message. It didn't reach them. So those who reject includes those who reject God as their as their Lord outright, as an atheist does. Now rejecting God, I don't know if this is justifiable on the day of judgment even if someone 
you know, didn't, you know, uh, hear about revelation. It seems that even through reason that you, you should be able to conclude that you have a creator. But Allah, Allah will have to make that determination. So kufr has different levels. So you have kufr in the sense of rejecting the existence of God. You have the kufr of those who deny his oneness. You have kufr in the, in the form of rejecting his commandments. So someone might believe in God, but they reject his commandments, his instructions, or they rebel against him by disobeying. So all of these people are deserving of, of punishment. It's a type of kufr. Now, Alama Tabatabai has an interesting discussion on the on the notion of kuf in the Quran. He says that in most cases, when the word kufr is used in the Quran, not all, in most cases, it refers to the stubborn rejection of the truth, known as kufrul juhud. You know, there's a difference between someone who's who is not Muslim and someone who has studied Islam, who has who has been taught Islam and they reject Islam. You know, there's a difference between you know Abu Lahab and someone who lives in Alabama who's never heard of Islam and doesn't believe in the, the Prophet, doesn't believe in in the teachings of Islam, doesn't believe in the hereafter. These are not the same. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah taba taba, He says, in most cases, kufr in the Qur'an is a reference to the, the stubborn rejection of the truth after the truth has be become apparent. Thus, in most in instances, kufr is presented as a moral problem. Their rejection of the truth is not because the truth is ambiguous or because they just don't understand or they're not convinced. It's related to arrogance. It's related to stubbornness. It's related to unjustifiable skepticism. It's related to hubbu dunya, the love of the material world. It's an epistemological issue. Now, now you may ask, you know, what is this severe punishment? The Quran speaks a lot about punishment and Jahannam. What is the reality of this punishment? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as a general rule of thumb, He gives people what they want. You know, this is the nature of free will. Free will means you do what you want, but you have to live with the consequences. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives people what they want. This applies in dunya and applies in akhir. He gives them what they want, meaning he gives them free will and they make certain decisions. And hell, jahannam, this severe chastisement, this severe punishment, if someone were to ask you, what is jahannam? In a nutshell, jahannam is nothing other than the physical manifestation of separation from God. That is the essence of hell. Hell is the physical manifestation of turning away from God. And some people want that. There are some people that want that. They want that separation. And this is why people who are in Jahannam, they cannot enter Jannah. Not because there is a sign and the malaika are holding them back. Existentially, they cannot be in paradise. Because paradise is what? We'll get, this, we'll, we'll, we'll get to this in a Paradise is the physical manifestation of attachment to Allah. So if someone turns away from God, it's not in their nature to be in that environment. Now, Kofra, notice here, Allah says, الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ شَدِيدٌ Those who reject, they will have a severe punishment. And then when Allah speaks about those who believe, he says, Faith requires good deeds. But when Allah speaks about kufr, kufr is enough for you to be deserving of punishment. Allah doesn't say, Allah doesn't say, those who reject and do evil deeds. If you reject and you do good deeds, you're still deserving of punishment. 
Because your belief was corrupted. Now, why is belief so important? Because when you take on a belief, you intend to keep it forever. And this is why beliefs are compensated eternally. So if someone has a proper aqidah, but they have evil actions, and action is something that is what? It's, it has a temporary reality. But aqidah is something that is compensated eternally because it's, it's, it's intended to be kept uh, forever. And this is why having problems with aqidah is, is very dangerous. Now, going back to the, the issue of, uh, of kuf, this is what Allama Tabatabai means when he speaks about kufrul juhud. There are some people who reject the truth, not because they need more information or they're not convinced, but rather they have some other considerations, arrogance, stubbornness. They're attached to you know, uh, power, money, position. Allah says, فَلَمَّا سورة النمل فَلَمَّا جَاءَتْهُمْ آيَاتُنَا مُبْصِرَةً But when there came to them our visible signs, our clear signs, قَالُوا هَذَا سِحْرٌ مُبِينٌ They dismissed it as this is just obvious magic. You know, this is a bunch of uh, sorcery. It's, it has, it's not real. And then Allah says what? وَجَحَدُوا بِهَا وَاسْتَيْقَنَتْهَا أَنفُسُهُمْ ظُلْمًا وَعُلُوًا Allah says, and they rejected them. They rejected the signs. While their souls were convinced. They, don't, they won't admit it, but deep down in their hearts, they know this is the reality. Why do they reject? Because, of inju- because they've done so much ظلم. Their hearts cannot even function properly. They can't even perceive the truth. And because of their arrogance, they don't want to bow their heads to a higher power. They don't want to be under the guardianship of a higher power. It's because of their vulm and their arrogance. This is what is blinding. This is what is preventing them. It's not that the truth is unclear. It's because they're arrogant. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ وَأَجْرٌ كَبِيرٌ This is a lot, the end of, the, uh, of verse number 7. And those who believe and do righteous deeds will have forgiveness and great reward. Now again, iman is not enough. Salvation cannot be achieved if someone just says, you know, I believe in God and I love the Prophet and that's it. No, you need amal salih. Because good deeds... So you need to have the you need to have faith, proper faith, to be able to, to be able to perform good deeds. Because you have to, because what is good is what Allah subhanahu There are some things that you intuitively know are good. You know, it's good to help the poor. It's good to you know respect your parents. There are some things that in our fitrah we recognize them as good. But other things we need assistance from the Sharia. It's good to pray, but how do we pray? So Faith, we need faith to be, able to, to be able to perform good deeds. And we also need good deeds to secure our faith. Do you, think, do you think someone who doesn't pray, who doesn't care about salah, do you think when they're on their deathbed, they will be able to hold on to their iman? No, it could be brothers and sisters that someone is born Muslim and they're Muslim by name and they might go to the masjid, but they don't pray, they don't fast. They reject and they, they're, uh, they're careless about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, commandments. Do you think such a person will be able to hold on to their iman when they're in their last moments? We think that they died Muslim, but they died as kuffar. And you might have someone who doesn't have faith, but because they did so much good in their life, you, we might consider them to be non-Muslim, but on their deathbed, they connect their hearts to Allah. And they, they might die, and Allah accepts them as believers. So because of their good deeds, Allah gives them the tawfiq of having, finding the truth. You know, people like, you know, Salman al-Farsi, people like Abu Dhar. Abu Dhar was a mushrik. 
What made him, how did he get the tawfiq to become a follower of the Prophet? Because he was honest. He was a very truthful person. So the, the good deed of truthfulness gave him the tawfiq of finding faith. So you need both of them. You need faith to do good. And you need good to, to find faith or to secure faith. They, they're, they're interconnected. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ وَأَجْرٌ كَبِيرٌ So these people are paradise bound. But here Allah mentions that those who have faith and do good deeds, you know, most people, they, the, the, the most people who have faith and do good, they're going to slip. They're going to commit sins. You know, we're not the mukhlasin that Iblis was talking about. We're going to slip. We're going to have shortcomings. Allah says, if you have faith and do good deeds, I will forgive you and I will grant you a great reward. Maghfirah comes before Ajrun Kavi. Why? Because to enter Jannah, your heart has to be purified. So the soul must be purified through this forgiveness before it can enter and enjoy the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that world. And paradise, so we said. Hell is the physical representation of distance from Allah, of turning away from God. Jannah, what is Jannah? The reality of Jannah is that Jannah is the physical manifestation of being attached to Allah, of being close to Him, of obeying Him, and devoting yourself to Him. With that, inshallah, we will uh, conclude our session. Uh, for today and uh, we'll pick up inshallah next week with verse number 8 bi'ithnillahi ta'ala wa akhru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin Allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ali muhammad wa ajjil farajam Any questions or comments before we end our session? Um, the conditions that uh, Shaitan asked Allah and Allah agreed to were, is that um, from the Quran or from the Hadith? The, the seven conditions that you mentioned. So they're they're both, as I mentioned. Some of the demands, some of the requests that he makes, are mentioned in the Quran. You know, for example, is mentioned in the Quran. The others are mentioned in Hadith uh, Hadith literature. So when you combine the Quranic verses and the Hadith you get a more holistic picture of the, the conversation that ensued. Thank you. And uh, the, the meaning of Abdullah's name was really interesting because you said it means he despaired, but Shaitan's story is usually, usually told as one about arrogance. So where did the despair come from? Where does the despair come from? That's a good question now. Of course, it, it, it's not that Iblis feels that uh, that he committed a sin and he, he doesn't think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will forgive him. The despair, despair in the sense that he reached a point where he's lost hope in God's mercy because he has positioned himself as someone who's trying to correct God. Meaning that Iblis, up until today, believes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a mistake by designating Adam as, as the Khalifa, as choosing Insan as Khalifatullah. So he, he despairs from God's mercy, not because he has acknowledged his mistake and he feels that he transgressed and God would never forgive him. Forgive him. He's lost hope in God's mercy and his forgiveness because he believes that God has erred. And he is, he is the one that he is qualified, that he was qualified to, to be Khalifatullah. Because he says, Ana that you're, you made a mistake. How, why am I being asked to prostrate to this creature, this wretched creature? I'm, I'm comfortable worshiping you. See, Iblis, Iblis doesn't have a problem with Allah. He has a problem with this command that 
Oh Allah, why have you elevated this creature? I am more worthy. I've worshipped. I have this track record of, of worship, of devotion to you. So this, so his his despair stems from this, that he finds himself that can you I mean can you imagine how deluded a creature can be that he thinks God is wrong? In fact, we have some narrations where where Isa alayhi salam pleads with him. Isa says to Allah, oh Allah, you're the most merciful. Why don't you forgive Iblis? You're... So Allah says, I will forgive him. You know, if he simply says that, oh Allah, I made a mistake, pardon me. And let him go make up his sajda at the grave of Adam. Let him go prostrate to the grave of Adam and I'll forgive him. So Isa alayhi salam, you can imagine, this is wonderful news. Allah has, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has offered to forgive Iblis. So Iblis appears, Isa alayhi salam presents this deal to him, that if you, you know, ilahi akhta'at farham, well, I made a mistake, forgive me, and then go and prostrate to the grave of Adam and everything's forgiven. What was the response of Iblis? I made him his, I want Allah to ask me for forgiveness. Can you imagine? So this is what we mean when we say that he dis, he's lost hope in God forgiving him because in his mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who's in the wrong. It's a very bizarre perspective, but this is this is what we find in the narrations. That, that is really interesting. And and then the, the story of uh, Lisa demands in Quran, uh, chapter or Surah 38, verses 82. Um, uh, what it says, like, uh, by, by your might, surely I will mislead them all. It, it's really interesting that Iblis says, by your might. Why, 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 does he, uh, why is he promising by Allah's might instead of anything else? You know, this is also interesting because this also indicates to us that he believes so he he so this this shows you how 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 deep his understanding of tawhid is so he believes that allah so we tawhid has different levels so we have tawhid al that we believe that god is the only creator and he he, he iblis has attested to this ana khayrun min khalaqtani min naran wa khalaqtahu min tin Oh Allah, I'm better than him. You created me from fire and you created him from clay. So Iblis acknowledges the Tawheed al Khaliqiyah, that God is the only creator. Not only that, here he, he's, he seems to also acknowledge Tawheed al Rububiyah, Tawheed al Af'al, that nothing can happen without God's power. So when he says, by your might, meaning that he's even acknowledging that I can, I will misguide them using the power that you gave me. So he, Iblis doesn't even see himself as operating independently of God's power. So imagine, so subhanAllah, you can believe in all of all aspects of Tawheed, but if you reject Khalifa to Allah, Allah banishes you. So Iblis is not a mushrik. He simply says, I don't, I refuse to acknowledge the one. You know, those who, who reject the, the prophets and, uh, and those who have been designated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is an acknowledgement of Tawheed al-Af'al. All power is, comes from God. The, even the power I use to misguide others is God given. So he, so Iblis sees himself as faqir, even as he's challenging Allah. So even as, even in his rebellion, he acknowledges that even my ability to rebel is because you've given me the ability to rebel. It's a very warped uh, worldview, but this is this shows you. You know how much animosity, how much, how dangerous envy is 
He was so envious of Adam because he thought that he was a more suitable candidate for the position of being Khalifatullah. I mean, there's this frustration in him that after all these thousands of years of worship, Adam, Adam is Khalifatullah, this human being. Because you have to understand that there, there was this impression that anything that is from dunya, from the earth, is inherently inferior. Because you know, Iblis used to go to the higher Samawat. If you're telling me that a, a creature that is from clean, from dirt, is going to be above me and I have to prostrate to him and I have to recognize his spiritual excellence. So this is where you see Iblis lost his mind. And it just unleashed this, uh, this vitriol that was within him. Wow. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Thank you so much. And uh, there's a question. Uh, it's asking about what are the parallels and especially the discrepancies between the Quranic view of Iblis and the biblical view, other than the fact that the biblical view says that Iblis was an angel and uh, the stuff on original sin. So other, other than those two things. I mean, in, in the Bible, we see that Iblis, so this the, the verse that I have on the screen right now is, is something that seems to be unique to the Quran. Because when you look at the Bible, Iblis is able to misguide everybody. All the prophets were misguided by Iblis. But in the Quran, he acknowledges the spiritual purity of God's chosen servants. You know, this is, this is one distinct, uh, this is one difference that we see. Another difference, I would have to check this, but I, I it seems that uh, that this is specific to the, the Islamic tradition where he's not able to take the form of, uh, of a prophet or a successor of a prophet and, uh, and a believer. It seems that in the Christian tradition, there's no limitation on the, the forms that he can, he can assume. Off the top of my head, those are a few... Uh, few differences that we see but the most important is that in the tr in the christian tradition they don't believe in the infallibility of prophets and in iblis in that tradition succeeded in misguiding all of them it seems that only isa is considered to be infallible but even then if you look at the bible there are also passages that seem to even call his character into question so this is something that's unique to the uh, the islamic tradition and how did the whispers of Iblis relate to the idea of Tarqul Aula? Uh, is that caused by the Iblis's whispers or is it different? So, yeah, I mean, it, <clears throat> it could be, it could be related to, uh, to satanic whispers, but it's not, it's not, uh, with them, you know, when, uh, he, so he's not able to misguide them in the sense of sin or, or forgetfulness. Now, he might be able to affect them in the sense that he suggests to them to abandon something that is, is better uh, uh, and, and replace it with something that is good. And this is one of the tactics of shaitan, that he distracts you, what is, he distracts you from, what is, uh, from what is better and he preoccupies you with something that is good. But he distracted you from something that is even better. This seems to... This seems possible with, with, uh, with certain prophets. Uh, and uh, one question, what, what is the best protection against shaitan in day-to-day -day life? So Dick, you know, mindfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, you know, be, and being mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't just mean, you know, just to recite, mechanically recite adhkar. It's to be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's, it's also good to get into the habit of reciting al-ma'udhatayn, reciting uh, the two surahs, you know, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ these are, these are surahs that the Prophet used to recite over Imam al-Hassan, Imam al-Hussein regularly for their protection. <clears throat> it's, uh, 
of course, paying charity is a way of repelling misfortunes. And Shaitan always wants us to experience uh, <clears throat> misfortunes. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, when we recite, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim we shouldn't take this statement lightly. This is something that we're encouraged to recite before we begin reciting the Quran. Because when we, when we do good, shaitan is most active. Shaitan becomes very active when you, you, you seek refuge from shaitan when you recite the Quran. Why? Because shaitan attacks at these moments. The, the place where we offer our prayer, it's called mihrab. Mihrab literally means battlefield, a place of battle. So shaitan becomes very active when we want to do good. And, and that's why whenever we do good, we should mention the name of Allah. Because mentioning the name of God, being God conscious, repels shaitan. It, it, he literally flees when we are engaged in Allah's remembrance and we're mindful of God. And mindful of God means that you, you're aware of what is pleasing to God and what is displeasing to God in any given situation. This is really the essence of, of dhikr. It doesn't, doesn't make sense for someone to have a, 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 the prayer beads, the masmaha. He's reciting tasbih al-zahra and he's, he's looking at non-mahram. What type of dhikr is this? Dhikr means to be conscious of, conscious of what is pleasing to Allah and what is displeasing to him. And could you talk about the, what, what is the connection between the Jal and Shaitan? <clears throat> what is the connection between, so the Jal, again, there's a, there's a discussion about whether the Jal is a person or is a, is a, is a system that is, uh, is prevalent at the time. In any case, the Jal is a, he is, he is part of the satanic uh, system, meaning that he, he's considered one of the soldiers of shaitan. If you want to consider him a literal person or it's one of the tools of shaitan. So the, the, the Dajjal means the great deceiver. And uh, so if you consider him to be an actual person, and this is what it seems to be the case in Sunni traditions, in Shia traditions, there's there's a lot of discussion. There's not that many hadith about the Dajjal in the Shia tradition. And there's a debate about whether it's a person or it's an ideology. In any case, it's it's definitely a force of, of evil and misguidance that Shaitan will make use of. Thank you very much, Shaykh. Uh, and uh, we will uh, we will meet inshallah bi if Allah gives us tawfiq uh, next week. Jazakumullah. Thank you so much for lending me your ears and thank you Zain again for facilitating this may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all among the students of the Quran thank you very much Sheikh. may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and keep you on the perfection of Imam Sahib al-Zaman Allah ta'ala farajah al-Sharif and your family and all the ulama al-haq may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect them inshallah and give them a long healthy life with abundance of iman and our heartfelt condolences to all the shia ummah around the world for what happened in beirut lebanon yes may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant sabr to the families who have lost lost their loved ones and uh, i came to know uh, about half an hour ago that there are a lot of people who are still missing Yes. Yes. May Allah give them sabr and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, uh, <clears throat> you know, make this time less painful for them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable, inspire the hearts of people to give generously and to support them. I heard a report <clears throat> earlier today or last night that over 300,000 people have been displaced uh, because of this, uh, this blast. So, you know, inshallah, if we're able to offer any type of assistance we should definitely do so and what's just as important as the financial assistance is to recite surah al-fatiha for uh, for those who have passed to also give sadaqa on behalf of the deceased you know we, we shouldn't forget you know sometimes we we, we think about the uh, the living but we should we should also think about those who have passed on it's not just a matter of 
burying them and and uh, and that's and that's it. We have to also we have a duty towards the the living and the and the dead. So inshallah, we're able to uh, to uh, to help both of them in, uh, in 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 any way that we're able to. Yeah, and may Allah subhanahu wa taala destroy the enemies of Ahl al Bayt. Inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. With take very good care of yourself, Sheikh. Thank you so much. Please keep me in your dua and we'll we'll see you next week.